important message on current and future events, Broadway's own pastor, Pastor Mick Foster. There you go, there you go. For the word. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you all, all your handsome faces. Amen. Going to start a new series today. And the title of the series is, anyone look? Maranatha. Maranatha. Amen. Maranatha. We're going to look at why all Christians should desire for Jesus to return soon. Why that should, should be our hearts. To want Jesus to come back right now. Amen. Just as soon as possible. <clears throat> A lot of the info I'm going to share with you in the series is uh, from some of Dr. David Reagan's uh, writings. Uh, I've been... Uh, getting fed by his ministry for years. <clears throat> and he's got some good stuff here, and, and I want to share some of it with you and some of my own that the Lord's given me. You know, as every year, uh, every new year comes along, I find myself earnestly yearning that this might be the year that will initiate the events that will lead to the Lord's return to this earth. Could be this year. Amen. Now, one of those events we know that we're looking forward to is the rapture of the church. Aren't we? Yes. And in fact, come October, I'm going to do a series on the rapture, not on Sunday mornings. It's only going to be in evenings so that we can have others from other churches come. Uh, I've been told that um, many churches uh, don't teach, don't look at eschatology. You know what eschatology is? An old seminary word for uh, the study of last things. So it's the study of the end times, uh, the, uh, the last things concerning uh, what's going to happen in this earth. So, so Point being, there, there are many congregations that don't look at the rapture. They don't, don't look at the return of Christ. They, you know, they don't look at uh, a final judgment. They don't, they don't look at the millennium. Uh, and they don't know much about them. And if there's one event that the church should be excited about and talking about, it's the rapture. <clears throat> so... Come this fall, you can start telling others about it, praying for it, please. We're going to do a series uh, on the rapture right here with the intentions of uh, inviting others from other churches to come. <clears throat> and we know following the rapture is the Great Tribulation, seven years, a period of unparalleled horror. And that will culminate in the return of Jesus to reign on this earth, over this whole earth. And as we look at the writings of the early church fathers from the years 100 to about the year 300, something comes clear in those messages. And that is that one of the earliest prayers of the church was Maranatha. Maranatha. That word is actually an Aramaic phrase that means, Our Lord, come. In fact, the early church would use the word Maranatha for in place of hello, <clears throat> or in place of goodbye. So when they'd run into another believer, uh, then, then uh, they would say to them, instead of, How you doing? They'd say, Maranatha. Or when he's leaving somebody, like I, when I leave the church each day, the, uh, I'll go down the hallway and I'll yell back to Tammy, Maranatha. And, this, and the purpose being to remind each other, using the word Maranatha, 
that Jesus is coming, to be ready for Jesus coming. And that's, that's, a, that's a purpose for this series that we're starting here today. We need to make sure we are always ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, the word Maranatha expresses a, <clears throat> a fact that is confirmed by many other scriptures, namely that the first century church had an ardent desire for the re soon return of Jesus. They were looking for him way back then, <clears throat> as we should be looking for him now. Let's pray. Father, you know when our hearts need stirred and what they need stirred about. And we invite you to do some of that stirring today, to keep our minds where they need to be, to keep our desires where they need to, to be. Move in us, Lord. Help us be ready for your return. And please anoint this teacher in Jesus' name. And the believers said, Amen. Amen. The 21st century church seems to have lost that desire that the early church had for Jesus Christ to return. In fact, most professing Christians today do not pray Maranatha. They do not yearn for the return of the Lord. Instead of yearning for His re return, I'm just afraid that many Christians today are yawning about His return. And preachers too. In fact, I'd blame preachers more than anybody because the preachers are supposed to be the ones God's using uh, to keep people spiritually where they're supposed to be. Christendom at large is caught up in apathy regarding the return of Jesus. Why do you suppose that is? What, what do you think? I think it's we're so caught up in what's gone on in the here and now in this world that we don't have time in our thoughts to be, uh, to be thinking about the return of Christ, to keep that on top of our minds. We're too connected to the world and what we want to see happen in this old world. That's sad because the, because the Word of God says that the return of the Lord is our blessed hope. How many heard of that phrase before, the blessed hope? Amen. <clears throat> the blessed hope. That's a hope with blessings. We're, we're admonished in the Scriptures to watch for the Lord's coming and to be ready for the Lord's coming. So how many have you, don't answer, have you been praying for the Lord to return? You know, let's, let's, let's get home here. Have you, in your prayers, been praying for Jesus to return now, soon as possible? Come today, Jesus. Is that your yearning? The more I see this world getting darker and evil, the more wicked it gets, the more I desire Jesus' return. Because when He comes back, He's going to fix it all. Hallelujah. And things are going to be good here because He will be in charge of everything. We need to be praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus Himself said in Luke chapter 12, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps alight for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect Him. And Paul exhorted Titus in, in, uh, in one of his letters in uh, Titus chapter 2 starting at verse 12. Titus 2, 12 and 13. <clears throat> and we are instructed 
to turn from godless living, to turn from sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Now, if Paul called the world that he was living in an evil world, what about today? So, turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will re be revealed. Now, here's a place where one of the modern translations, the one I use every Sunday, just about, uh, I think is messed up and messed us up because this is the scripture that brings up the blessed hope. But did they word it that way in this translation? Nope. But some of you, if you have other translations, you'll see it mentioned right here in, um, in verse 13, while we look forward to the blessed hope. How can you leave that phrase out of the Bible? How could you change that? And they, they, they did, they have the blessed hope. Hallelujah. That should be, that is high on our priority list. The blessed hope. The hope with blessing. Now you have some hopes, don't you, about some things in the future. Maybe you hope to see your kids or your grandkids find a right mate, get married, get a good job, and, and uh, add to the family. And, or maybe your hope that uh, you, you're able to reach retirement. And, uh, or maybe your hope, you have a hope that you're going to get to go on vacation somewhere that you've never been before. Or maybe you're hoping that, that uh, you'll get to uh, do some kind of business adventure. Maybe you have plans. You all have plans, don't you? Would you call any of your plans blessed hopes? This hoping for Jesus' return, of course, is more of a hope because he's coming, but this desire, it's a hope that has a blessing. Why does hoping for the Lord's return have a blessing with it? Because we tend to stay ready, don't we? And just as Paul was mentioning to Titus here, if we're, if we're hoping for his return, then we are going to stay from godless living. We'll be more likely to stay away from sinful pleasures because we want to be ready. Amen. <clears throat> Come, Lord Jesus. And so there's a blessing in being ready, the hope for his return. And as Paul was facing death, he was in prison, and he, and he wrote uh, in the book of Timothy, chapter 2, verses, uh, chapter 4, excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses 7 and 8. I want to start at verse 6. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Is that how you see your life? You, you see the activities of your life, the, all that you've been doing with your life being poured out as an offering to God? The time of my death is near. Maybe this time next year there are going to be some of us missing from the worship service. We'll be in another worship service. That could be. Someone, some of us in here could be. Paul knew that his time was coming around. I have fought the good fight, he said. This is a battle here, isn't it? To stay faithful to Jesus Christ with the way we live these lives. It's a battle, it's a struggle. But he fought that good fight. He said, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful faithful to what God had called him to do. How you doing? What's God want you to do? Well, one main thing is he wants you to pass on the news about Jesus, isn't it? Isn't that right? And he wants to use your life 
a holy, pure, and good life to show the lost world what God is like. Isn't that part of our purpose here? Well, how's that purpose go again? We are, um, what, what are we doing here? We have a purpose, right? We haven't covered it in a while, apparently, right? We are striving for holiness, aren't we? And we are seeking the lost. That's what our purpose is. Well, Paul remained faithful to his calling. <clears throat> and now, verse 8, he says, The prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness. I believe that crown of righteousness, that means being right with God, is, is the, the crown that, uh, you know, it's not a special thing, it's for all believers, those who are right with God. Now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So when, when does Paul get the crown of righteousness? What's it say there? On the day of, of Jesus' return. When do, will you get your crown of righteousness? Everyone who has died trusting in Jesus before us, when do they get this prize? When Jesus Christ returns. Oh, what a day that will be when Jesus Christ we see. You get your crown saying, you are right with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The prize is not just for me, but for all who, look at that next phrase, for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So apparently those who are right with God are eagerly looking forward to his appearing. Does that go in that verse? And can we turn that around and say, Therefore, um, all who are eagerly looking forward are right with God, and vice versa. Those who are right with God are eagerly looking forward to His return. We can switch that back and forth, can't we? So being right with God, if we're right with God, we are desiring and looking forward to His coming back. So we'll be praying that way, won't we? Hmm, interesting. And, and how is it that people can look forward? Looking forward. With anticipation? Because we know we're right with God. And we're living accordingly. Then we can then we are earnestly looking for His return. Do you have a zealous yearning in your heart for the Lord's soon return? Do you pray, Maranatha? How your prayer has been going concerning this. Have you been praying for the Lord Jesus to return soon? Are you right with God? Hmm? I want to invite you to use the word Maranatha more in your life in order to remind me and other believers around you and remind yourself, our Lord Jesus come to help us be uh, more alert and cognizant of Jesus coming back again. Use that word Maranatha as a hello and a goodbye, back and forth. I want to invite you to join me in using that word. Did you know that in the New Testament alone, the second coming of Jesus Christ is referred to over 300 times? <laughs> Doesn't that blow you away? Did you notice that as you, as you read your word, how often... How often it's brought up, Jesus Christ coming back again. In fact, the night before Jesus went to the cross, he was alone with his disciples. 
and he needed to remind them that he was coming back again. And he did that uh, in the book of John, uh, chapter 14. We're going to lead up to verse 3. I'm going to start in verse 1. Jesus said to, to his disciples, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. You don't have to be troubled. You don't. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. I don't think you get your own mansion. We get to live in the same castle with God Almighty. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you. He's coming back to get you so that you will always be with me where I am. God made you. He created you. Now, you've created a few things. You've made a few things, haven't you? And some of those things, did you get connected to them while you were, while you were uh, making them? We tend to do that, don't we? We work on something, uh, creating something, we get connected to it. Now, you, you could, can you imagine how connected to you Jesus is because Jesus created you? He put all your intricate parts together. You know, the physical side, he made you different from everyone else in here physically. And then he put all the details in your personality, uh, the positive stuff to make you who you are different from others. You know, he put the fine touch on you. He created you. And that drew him to uh, even closer to you. He loves you because he made you. So he wants to spend eternity with you. Do you see it, church? He does. So he's coming back to get you, his creature. He's coming back. And, and Jesus was reminding his disciples, I'm coming back to get you. Only be gone for a while. I'm coming back. And, and then um, remember his ascension? While, while his followers were rubbernecking, you know, watching him go off up into the, into the clouds, two men in white appeared. And they said that Jesus would come back in the same manner in which he left. We read that in uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. It said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here rubbernecking toward heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Hallelujah. Now, because of that scripture and other scriptures about his return, we learn that Jesus' second coming will be personal. So it's not like he comes back and there's a big crowd of his followers and you're stuck back in the crowd there, you know, and he doesn't really get to lay eye, eye on eye towards you. Nope, it's going to be personal, the scriptures. Somehow, when he comes back again, he's going to come back to you. He's God. Somehow he's going to do that. It's going to be a personal return. Also, the scriptures let us know that it's going to be a bodily return. That he's not going to be like um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and some other um, so-called churches say that Jesus comes back spiritually. Nope, he's coming back bodily, in a body that you, that you and I uh, can touch, a body with feet that we can kiss. Our Jesus is coming back in body. Hallelujah. And the scriptures also let us know it's going to be visible. His return. Hallelujah. You won't, I won't have to look for a fox alert on my phone. You know, they think Jesus has showed up in Syria. You know, no, won't, won't have. Everybody, I don't know how, but all his followers are going to know they're going to see him when he returns. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, I believe that there are at least six reasons why every one of us 
should earnestly desire Jesus to return soon. And that's what the rest of this series is going to be about. And let me just share one of them with you now. When Jesus returns, he will get what he deserves, which will be glory and honor and power. This is one of the reasons I want to see him come back. See, when he came the first time, he was repudiated by the Jews. He was rejected by his hometown people. He was spurned by his own family. They thought he was crazy. He was persecuted by the religious leaders, the people that should have welcomed him and worked underneath him. He was betrayed, betrayed by a close friend. He was denied by another friend three times. Remember that? He was deserted by his disciples at the time he needed their support the most. He was mocked by the masses. He had no place to lay his head. His only possession was a robe. He was born in a stable. He was raised in poverty. He was nailed to a tree and buried in a borrowed tomb. And today, people scoff at him and ridicule him. And his name is a curse word. That is not what my Jesus deserves. And it's going to be different when he returns. <laughs> the first time he came as a gentle and helpless baby, he's going to return as a mighty warrior. He came the first time as a suffering lamb to die for the sins of the world. But he will return as a conquering lion who will pour out the wrath of God on those who've rejected the love, mercy, and grace of God. His first coming was marked by compassion and humility and the willingness to be judged and to die. He will return in triumph and in wrath to judge and make war against the enemies of God. He came the first time as a servant He's returning as a monarch. Jesus was humiliated in history. Don't you want to see him vindicated and glorified in history? Church? And he will be because his father has promised him that he will reign over all the earth. Let's look at Psalm number 2. Starting at verse 6. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. It's as good as done. Who is God's chosen king? Help me out, church. Jesus, that's right. And where is he, where is he going to set up his throne? Yes, Jerusalem on this holy mountain. What's the name of the mountain? Zion or Mount Moriah. This is God's promise to Jesus. Next verse. The king proclaims Yahweh's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. On another translation, it says, I am revealing that you are my son. Next verse. Only ask my son and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. That's God's promise, the Father's promise to Jesus Christ the Son. You will rule over the whole earth. It's as good as done. And he also promised Jesus that he will manifest his glory before his saints and before the nations of the earth. Let's look at Isaiah 66, verse 18. When you see these things, your heart will rejoice. It's talking about the, uh, the last things, the last times. 
your heart will rejoice. You will flourish like the grass. Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants and his eager and his anger against his enemies. You're going to see both. Next verse. See the Lord is coming with fire and his swift chariots roar like a whirlwind. He will bring punishment with the fury of his anger and the flaming fire of his hot rebuke. That's old, this is Old Testament stuff here. Next verse. The Lord will punish the world by fire and by his sword. He will judge the earth and many, many will be killed by him. Next verse. Those who consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred garden with its idol in the center, feasting on pork and rats and other detestable, detestable meats, those who put anything or anyone before Jesus himself will come to a terrible end, says the Lord. Verse 18, I can see what, you are, what they are doing, and I know what they are thinking. So I will gather all nations and peoples together, and they will see my glory. People will, it'll be like, it'll be like uh, eyes. Uh, let's see, how's that go? The, uh, the deer's eyes and the headlights. When, when we've not seen his full glory. When, when Jesus reveals the full glory of God, our eyeballs will go, whoa. And then it says, he says that his glory will be revealed in us at that time. Oh, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Paul says in, in, um, that Jesus is returning to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Jesus, come back and get what you deserve, the glory, honor, and power you deserve. Maranatha. Now next week I'll bring up the second reason why we should be desiring him to turn, return right away. Let me just give it to you. I'm not going to cover it, but I'll tell you what it's going to be. When Jesus returns, Satan will receive what he deserves, which will be defeat, dishonor, and humiliation. And we'll look at that more the next time. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Now, Jesus has sent me here to invite you to his table today, to gather around his table. So if there are uh, born-again people, kids, any place else in the church, go get them right now. Ushers, I invite the ushers to come forward right now and have a seat up front here. So parents, if you want to get some kids now, who understand what the Lord's Supper is all about, now's the time to get them. This morning we're going to have, have communion in the pews. And you remember the symbolism of being in the pews, right? See, Jesus has come and he's made us one, one family, his family. He has unified us. As you look around at, at, at our church family, at your brothers and sisters, and you think, I'm going to be in eternity forever with those who are gathered here with those who know Jesus. We are family forever. That's what Jesus has done. Hallelujah. God the Holy Spirit is in each one of us who has invited Jesus into their hearts. God the Holy Spirit is in each one of us and he's unified us and made us one 
through the work of Jesus Christ. And so we show that today by having communion and all partaking of the elements at exactly the same time. We show this unity that Jesus has brought about in us. From Isaiah chapter 53. Welcome, gang, those of you who just joined us. I'm reading from Isaiah 53. See if you know who's being talked about here. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus. Jesus calls his followers to come out from the world and to gather in his name. And that's why you show up here every Sunday. That's why this is high priority for you. Jesus has called you to gather here. We assemble around this table at his invitation. So let our thoughts be centered on Jesus and upon the sacrifice that he made for us and for everyone who will accept his grace. King David in Psalm 32 wrote this, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, David talking to God, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. How about we do the same thing right now as we do every time we gather around this table? As we examine ourselves and see if there's any unrepentant sins in us. So would you bow your heads with me? Would you and the Holy Spirit search lives, your life? Search for those unrepentant sins so that as we come together with Christ now at his table, there'll be nothing, no sin to separate us from him. And I ask you to confess those, just whisper, not so as anyone can hear, but still out loud. Whisper and get rid of those sins. Give them up to him now.
Oh, Jesus, thank you for paying for these sins with your blood long ago. Your word says, if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus, for cleansing us with your blood. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. This is the Lord's table. We invite all who have accepted him as their Savior to share in this observance. Father, we thank you for this bread and the sacrifice of Jesus' body for us. Thank you for his broken body. Ushers, come forward, please. Musicians. You may pass out the elements. Christ's body broken for you. Christ's body for you, Tim. Amen. body broken for you. Christ's body broken for you. In the same night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, said to his followers, Eat this in remembrance of me. Father, we give you thanks for this cup and the blood was poured out for us. Thank you, Father.
ushers. blood shed for you. Christ's blood shed for you. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup means the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death till he comes again. And I think there's a word for that coming again, isn't there? What is that word? Amen. Amen. 